Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. So earlier today on February 24th, I spoke with Ilya, a Russian anarchist living and organizing in Kiev, Ukraine. We spoke about the relationship between Russia and Ukraine, the history of the Maidan uprising and the war in the Donbass, resistance to the invasion of Ukraine and the Putin regime from within Russia by Russian anarchists, conspiracy theories about Ukraine promoted by Russia and Russian-aligned media outlets, critiques of the Ukrainian state, and anarchists choosing their own path of self-defense and revolutionary mutual aid in the face of invading armies. You can learn more following anarchists organizing resistance on the ground in Ukraine, as well as finding out how to donate to their initiatives and share your solidarity by visiting their link tree. It's linktr.ee forward slash operation dot solidarity. We're releasing this episode a little bit early, usually they come out on Sundays, but so that we can get this voice out at such an important moment as the bombs are dropping in Ukraine. No war but the class war, y'all. Would you please introduce yourself with whatever name, uh, preferred gender pronouns, location, or political affiliations that make sense for this conversation? Yes, my name is Ilya. I am an anarchist uh, from Russia, currently living in Kiev and staying in Kiev. I'd like to ask you a bit about what's been going on in Ukraine for the last few months with international tensions, um, but I kind of feel like a brief rundown of the sort of the relationship between Ukraine historically and with Russia would be kind of helpful. Could you speak a little bit about the historical relationship um, or, or the Soviet Union as it was at one point? Um, what sort of like emotional or nationalist claims does Russia make for occupying Crimea or for occupying Ukraine? Oh yes, sure. We have uh, some like big tensions uh, for at least for, from uh, the autumn, but it also happened through past several years, uh, several times already, where some threat of war was believed to be in the air. Uh, but um, as we see, only now it uh, really came into reality in full scale. So this is uh, how to say. The strategy of blackmailing and of pressure, which was uh, like, like uh, made by Putinist government uh, on the local authorities, also on, on local system. And um, relations are very bad between two countries uh, since uh, 2014, since after Maidan protests of 2013-14 uh, and uh, removal of the pro-Russian president Yanukovych, Russia invaded uh, Crimea and annexated it and uh, also invaded Donbas region uh, using some uh, more loyalty of part of uh, local population mm -hmm. to Russia. Uh, so historically, I guess maybe is not make a lot of sense to, to go really deep in the historical context. We can say briefly that uh, uh, in the very old times, like uh, maybe around uh, uh, thousand and uh, or 700 uh, years ago, uh, like uh, Ukrainians uh, and uh, like today Ukrainians and Russians and uh, then just Eastern Slavic peoples uh, were a part of a uh, common political entity and also of common linguistic groups like we are all still uh, Eastern uh, Slavic group, both uh, Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians, which speak uh, pretty close languages. But then the historical ways, uh, they really separated for some reasons. And um, uh, then uh, by the end, like it started already in 17th century and finished uh, in late 18th century uh, when territory of uh, modern Ukraine uh, was incorporated into Russian Empire. Uh, and since then we can uh, speak actually about colonization of uh, local territories by Russian Empire. Uh, with the Soviet Revolution um, labels, they changed. Uh, it was declared the equality uh, of peoples uh, and also internationalism uh, as uh, uh, as the main policy, uh, but still, actually, we can say that Soviet Union, in many aspects, uh, were still very imperial uh, designed state, uh, with the center in Moscow, with the predominance uh, of uh, Russian language, and uh, with uh, many in many different ways uh, centered uh, political and economical system into Moscow, into Russia. So after Soviet Union collapsed, uh, all the 
republics which uh, constructed Soviet Union in general, they got actual in the state independence. Uh, but then after Putin came uh, into power in uh, 1999, uh, then um, uh, he started this, I would say, neo-imperialist or neo-colonizational politics of uh, restoring the Russian state influence on the former uh, Soviet Union area. And uh, his politics about uh, helping pro-Russian presidents to come into power, like was with uh, Viktor Yanukovych uh, in Ukraine, uh, and then harsh uh, reaction on the situations when these presidents uh, would be thrown away from power, especially by the popular uprising, uh, which was uh, Maidan uprising. It was even not electoral pro uh, process, it was really a popular movement which threw Yanukovych away um, and overthrown him. So since then, I think uh, we can start uh, today period, like modern stage of Ukrainian-Russian uh, relations are started exactly in 2014 with the Yanukovych flee and uh, Crimea annexation. Like there's definitely some people in the quote unquote anti-imperialist left in other parts of the world that are saying that the territorial integrity of Russia and its border is being threatened by the de facto participation of Ukraine in in the EU or, or relationship to the European Union or relationship to NATO um, as if like as if Ukraine is necessarily um, it's either a part of the Russian Federation in the restoration of historical Russia or historical Soviet Union of the Stalin era, or it is gobbled up and controlled as a puppet state by the European Union and and by NATO, by Western capitalist powers or imperialist powers. So I'd like, uh, I'm sure a lot of our conversation is going to sort of play with that idea and break it down. But can you talk about that idea or how that relates to the, the Maidan movement and um, the annexation of uh, the Donbass and, and Crimea and sort of what, what's happened in, in those territories? Uh, yes. Uh, so maybe first we can touch this uh, nationalist uh, sentiment which you mentioned previously. Uh, like because uh, our peoples, uh, Ukrainians and Russians, are historically close and uh, also linguistically and culturally close. And also by the years of some imperialist rule, it was uh, like comparatively easy widespread of usage of Russian language around here, especially eastern and southern parts of the country. Uh, they speak predominantly Russian. And this gives uh, space for speculations that actually we are like one people, like, for example, Putin likes to speculate, uh, and that there is some somehow historical uh, reasons for our uh, so-called geopolitical integrity, uh, which is, of course, um, like just a propagandistic tool uh, for some authoritarian power with uh, some geopolitical ambitions to use this, um, how to say, this uh, historical and cultural toys for their own benefit to, to, to make some speculative ground for uh, their invasions. Uh, so... If we then jump to this uh, problem of NATO and uh, EU bringing Ukraine into the zone of influence by NATO uh, and the uh, European Union, of course, it's really it, it really takes place, especially since 2014, because uh, new authorities which came into power after Maidan uprising, they were clearly pro-Western. It is also hard to deny that a lot of locals have some pro-Western sentiment because uh, for people uh, in Eastern Europe and uh, in all post-Soviets, Western world still creates uh, somehow a, a role model of lifestyle, I would say, because uh, European Union has is very close and is not that uh, culturally distant. And still they have this, uh, how to say, nice uh, and comfortable Western life. And uh, many people say, uh, think that like in, in our regions, not only in Ukraine, in Belarus, in, in Russia as well, in every corner of uh, post-Soviet space, uh, people dream about having a, a life like this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also a matter uh, to be used by some political manipulators of so-called uh, pro-Western orientation. And uh, Ukraine is not an exclusion or even a bright example of it. Uh, however, still any uh, expansion of NATO and European Union is actually superficial because there were no uh, really even uh, suggestions or proposals for the Ukraine to join these organizations. So this, let's say, very chimerical, artificial threat 
uh, for Russian statehood, uh, once again is used as a tool uh, to justify pressure and invasion. This attempts to make, uh, as you said already before, uh, Ukraine a puppet state for uh, Putin's regime uh, or to wage war like we see it today. You've mentioned that there are more people in the East and the South who speak Russian, maybe are in the Orthodox Church, or f in some ways like identify with Russia. Can you say a few words about the quote-unquote people's republics in Donetsk and, and Luhansk and their relationship to Russia? Like the Duma just asked Putin to recognize the independence of these states, and, and he said that it was uh, years late that he should have done this before. But to your understanding, is there any truth that these are republics? How to say, Ukrainian society is very multi-layer in uh, cultural aspects. Uh, so linguistic affiliations, as well as religious affiliations, they not necessarily at all construct some political loyalties, uh, especially in terms like uh, pro-Russian or pro-Western. Yes, uh, southern and eastern uh, regions, they are very Russian-speaking, but uh, no way at all that um, majority of uh, the people, or even considerable number of the people, they support the I integration with the Putinist Russia. Like, no way, it's just not like this. Uh, also, Orthodox Church here is uh, separated into uh, different factions, uh, like we, we have here uh, both the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and uh, also uh, Ukrainian branch of Moscow Orthodox Church. This separation somehow uh, influenced the political loyalties, but also not fully. Like, even if person is Russian-speaking and go into Ukrainian branch of uh, Moscow Orthodox Church, it doesn't necessarily mean that this per person is uh, loyal to uh, Russian government. Uh, but still, yes, in Crimea and uh, in eastern and southern regions, there are more sympathizers uh, for uh, Russian state and also uh, for Putinist regime. And for example, uh, so-called op oppositional platform, the party which is still present, uh, present in uh, Ukrainian parliament, it holds clearly pro-Putin pro positions uh, and is still mostly supported in southern and uh, eastern areas, uh, but by no way by the majority of the population. So what I want to say briefly is that a lot of people who speak mostly Russian here, uh, they still by no way want uh, to be integrated in some new Russian new empire or to be uh, subjugated by uh, Putin's regime. This from the start. Uh, and about the political nature uh, like Crimea, uh, Crimea is another story. Like a, a lot of people, uh, I would say, actually associated associated themselves with Russia uh, in this territory, but also far from being the social consensus in Crimea about it. For example, indigenous uh, people of uh, uh, Crimea, which is Crimean Tatars, uh, they are in a very big numbers. They are really uh, not happy and disloyal to the so-called new authorities in Crimea, uh, and. Uh, they even try to resist somehow to it. Uh, so there is also a split w within uh, Crimean community, I would say, uh, would be correct to say. And about so-called popular republics, of course, uh, they are not republics at all. They could never exist without uh, direct support from the Russian state, both in economical conditions and uh, more important by military conditions. So of course, we need to say that there is some support from the grassroots uh, for this republic, but is not, not even nearly enough uh, to hold any anti-Ukrainian uh, separatist insurgency. Uh, so this is not authentic uh, separatist movement, actually. Uh, this is really mm, totally orchestrated by Russian state and uh, militar, uh, military. Uh, so this is no republics at all, actually. This is, uh, I would say, really criminal quasi-states uh, ruled by some sort of uh, mafias, uh, which is called governments of these so-called republics. And these mafias, uh, they hold the power uh, since they are fully controlled and uh, fully loyal and fully manipulated by Kremlin. In the past month, and particularly it's been escalating, you've seen more than 100,000 Russian troops along the eastern border with Ukraine, the participation in impromptu drills and war games involving tens of thousands uh, of aligned Belarusian troops to the north, naval deployments in the sea south of Ukraine, and the activation of troops in occupied Moldova. There have even been 
nuclear training exercises in recent days. And as I'm hearing, there's been shelling already in the Donbass, but um, I've heard that shelling has actually started in other parts of Ukraine, the parts that aren't occupied. There's also this this issue that Western governments and the Ukrainian government saying Russia is going to do a false flag activity to claim a reason to do an invasion. And there was, in fact, a car bomb of the head of security forces in one of the uh, quote unquote people's republics that uh, Russia was claiming was a terrorist act and, and an activity by the Ukrainian government. I guess we've sort of already talked about how this is just Russian expansion. Is there any sort of activity, any sort of truth to these, what's been called false flag activities, uh, or or the claims of active genocide in the eastern part of the country against Russian-speaking peoples, which the Putin administration regime has been using as an argument of why they needed to defend them? First of all, you are absolutely correct. Uh, today, early morning, we got up uh, because uh, every p- parts of Ukraine were actually bombed uh, by the heavy airstrikes from uh, Russian side. Uh, as far as I can estimate up to now, uh, their main uh, target uh, were uh, both uh, civil and military airports uh, and also other military uh, targets, uh, but they uh, bombed pretty near uh, to the civil inhabited places, and as far as I know, uh, up to now dozens uh, of civilian civilians already killed by Putinist forces from the sky. About your question, like by no way I want uh, to whitewashing uh, the Ukrainian state. First of all, like I would not call Ukrainian state like super nationalist, even though this is. Of course, classic nation state, actually, with all its obvious shortcomings and also with some politics uh, for ethnic and uh, national unification, uh, which is unjust, of course. So what else uh, should be uh, said about it? That uh, this is also a very neoliberal and poor state, like uh, providing uh, continue, continuously and extensively uh, neoliberal reforms which are reducing uh, social help and uh, safety for the working people, for the just uh, like poor people of this country. And uh, some nationalist sentiment, of course, is present in this society. Uh, Like uh, some people believe that people here uh, should speak only Ukrainian language because the Russian language were absolutely um, uh, colonizers one. Uh, But this is, of course, nonsense from my point of view because millions of Ukrainians uh, prefer Russian language. All this uh, creates uh, splits within the society uh, and uh, create tensions and create a space for some uh, political advances of certain political forces. Uh, But of course, there is no ethnic cleansing. There is no... um, Genocide. Uh, this is like absolutely uh, over exaggeration, which is used uh, consciously uh, by Russian uh, forces, by Putinist forcen- forces, even I would prefer to say, uh, to play this card uh, of military invasion and of their uh, political expansion. Uh, like uh, th- there is no, how to say, for- forcibly uh, making people to speak another language, for example, uh, and there is no some like really repression and violence against people who may be not that much fit to uh, Ukrainian uh, nation state frame. Like there are certain problems, of course, but what we see today uh, is the just an attempt uh, to over exaggerate all the problems and to instrumentalize these problems for clearly imperialist aggression. Uh, we we just n- now uh, curfew is declared in Kiev uh, since 10 p.m., but we still have a lot of time before it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Do you have any so- sort of sense? So we see, I mean, with with the air raids, um, with the bombings that are happening, like it's it's clear that Russia is not just about saber rattling, which a lot of people were proposing beforehand. Um, that it was more about getting international attention and and proving itself that it can it can destabilize the Ukrainian economy and um, bring a lot of other world powers to the table. Uh, this was kind of a, an assumption of Putin's logic. Um, but at this point, obviously, it's, it's more than that. And a lot of people were saying beforehand that it didn't seem likely that Putin's 
or that the Russian regime would end up invading because uh, the military force that they could muster probably wouldn't be enough to actually occupy Ukraine um, between the um, all of the aid that's been coming internationally, the buildup of NATO and U.S. troops in neighboring countries, uh, the um, training of the Ukrainian population in like civil defense forces that seem to be preparing for the possibility of guerrilla warfare against an occupation. But all of that aside, Russia's doing what it's doing right now. Um, did trying to figure out what was going on with the Russian administration and where their decision making was was that helpful? Do you think, or was that kind of a distraction? To actually preparing for the real possibility of what we're seeing now? Well, if I understood your question correctly, I would think that uh, Russian government, like I am far from thinking that they are like stupid or crazy or something, but somehow they are really going wild uh, because they feel uh, that they are somehow facing the final uh, battle now. Like um, they lose popularity within Russia actually, and they need uh, some more more doping, I would say, to, to make it increase again, internal popularity. They also feel that uh, so-called international community is actually weak and fragmented, and they try to use these holes within this international community and with this uh, world establishment consensus to make some game change and to provide uh, their authoritarian interests. Like, I think uh, we can compare it fairly good with the behavior of Turkish state, which uh, has their own, let's say, popular republics in Syria, for example, and also extending their influence uh, abroad uh, its borders. Uh, so I think these uh, two new imperialist states, they uh, make actually very similar politics. Um, so uh, for me, it seems that uh, like uh, they understand. And also we need to remember that since 2014, uh, when European sanctions were imposed, uh, the economical situation in Russia is worsening uh, from year to year, uh, which also contributes to growing impopularity of this uh, regime in Russian minds, I would say. Uh, because of this, uh, I think that uh, Russian authorities feel themselves like still very powerful, and they are actually, but at the same time, um, they feel themselves a little bit, you know, like in the Ragnarok, like in some final battle for them to protect their privileged position and their full control over the country and abroad. And that's, that is the reason why uh, I think they play such wild games, uh, both inside uh, and abroad Russia. Are you aware of anti-militarist opposition inside of the Russian Federation, like this uh, building conflict has been simultaneous to Russia aiding the suppression in Belarus um, by Lukashenko, as well as putting down the Kazakh un unrest? Uh, yes, I am. I know that uh, a lot of people in Russia don't like war at all. I know this. I am pretty sure about this. Uh, this is obvious for me. At the same time, you need to know that all political opposition, both from liberal, far right uh, and anarchist leftist side, uh, were extensively smashed uh, during last years. For example, probably you heard uh, uh, even in uh, US about so-called uh, network case against Russian anarchists. And a lot of different cases were going like this. Uh, so uh, they also killed oppositional leaders like uh, liberal leader Boris Nemtsov. Uh, they now imprisoned Alexei Navalny, which one of the biggest populist liberal leaders uh, in Russian opposition. So um, they did work well to distract uh, all the uh, opposition forces. Uh, since 2000. Uh, 11, uh, we had uh, several uh, sparks, I would say, uh, sparks of um, a resistance, of protest, uh, really um, broad protest movements, uh, but they didn't succeed finally. They were more or less co-opted or smashed by the state, or they just died because time uh, passed away and uh, they still uh, gained no results. Uh, and after each of uh, these sparks, uh, the government uh, used their opportunity uh, to, uh, to suppress more and more the opposition. One big 
uh, last increase of the protests uh, we saw last winter in January 2021 uh, when this uh, populist Navalny returned to Russia and many of his supporters, but also even more of just people unhappy with the situation in the country, uh, they really came to the streets to in many, many Russian cities to protest, uh, to protest the uh, Putin politics. Uh, but they are, all were suppressed and then uh, repressions became uh, even harder and uh, uh, tens of people uh, were imprisoned. Uh, so now human rights defenders uh, speak about at least 1,000 uh, of political prisoners in Russia. And we need to know that uh, actually there are many more because um, human rights defenders, they do not recognize all the people who are being imprisoned for their political activities. Because of this now, uh, there are a lot of unhappiness with this war in Russia, but there is no organizational tools, some movement tools, which could uh, mobilize the people of Russia to protest against it. We already saw today uh, several separate actions against the invasion and against the war in Russia, in different cities of Russia. But it's still not a massive organized movement. For example, we see no big demonstrations, as far as I know. I still hope to, to see them, and maybe if war continues... Uh, it will happen, but up to up today, it doesn't exist uh, because this government uh, made a conscious work to destruct, to destroy uh, any internal opposition. Uh, but still, you know, for example, it's interesting that when uh, coronavirus vaccination started, uh, this anti-vax movement, they got also big grounds in Russian society. And uh, authorities even had to make uh, several steps back with this uh, vaccination and certifications uh, programs because even like you hardly expect uh, from Putin and from Russian authorities to to have any steps back uh, but that time they made because they really saw a, a big unhappiness growing within the population uh, so I still far from thinking they are almighty even internally not at all like uh, this is some how to say some ghost of protest and revolutionary movement within Russia, which still didn't take its forms, uh, but it definitely is present, it definitely exists. And this is one of the factors which uh, make Putinist government so wild to, to make such initiatives, let's say, as they do today. Uh, kind of on a side note and a question that I have in relation to COVID in Russia is, in the West, like media has represented protests concerning or or a lot of experience and a lot of uh, yeah a lot of protests around covid to be around a distrust of the quality of the shots that the russian government was making and maybe that's a misrepresentation and maybe it actually is the like an anti-vax overall in similar conspiracy theory ways that we have in the west too but is that is there any truth to that like what do you think was motivating the anti-vax movement in russia well, I think there is actually a lot of, um, how to say, this so-called COVID skepticism and a little bit of being skeptical about uh, medicine as well, like as which we can treat as some sort of ignorance, which actually exists uh, within the population. But at the same time, another portion of this anti-vax motivation, which maybe differs it from what we have in the West, but I may be mistaken, is that Russian population is highly, how to say, it doesn't believe the authorities. It doesn't believe that from above will come any good. Like uh, uh, they want to resist any invasion of the state programs within their private, their private lives. Because they know that uh, there are a lot of lies uh, going from TV channels and from the first uh, highest persons of the state. Uh, they used uh, to experience like uh, many tricks from this side. And because of it, they just don't believe the authorities. And this was the one of the factors for anti-vax uh, sentiments blossom in uh, in Russia. So as I understood, the Maidan protests in part were a push against the rule by Ukrainian oligarchs, although maybe it was in favor of some oligarchs over others. Uh, and they had like a vast controls um, in many ways parallel to the Russian oligarchs who, who Putin rules alongside. Some people, at least, who are arguing against the Russian invasion are positing it as supporting Ukraine. You've already laid a critique that it's a, a, a poor neoliberal state, um, a capitalist state. Can you can you talk a little bit 
more breaking apart these ideas of being against the invasion and in in favor of self-defense of the population versus supporting Ukraine as a political project or state? Yes, I do it with pleasure, actually, because this is, I believe, the most important point, actually. Uh, but first of all, some mm, preliminary uh, words, like uh, actually uh, Russian system and Ukrainian system are very different because all the Russian oligarchs, they are more or less uh, subjugated to this uh, unified authoritarian rule of Putin and his clique, uh, which uh, originates more in uh, former Soviet uh, secret services, uh, which is uh, Putin is former worker of. Uh, so this is... Um, pretty unified model of control uh, from one center, which is this we call Siloviks. I know that even in the West, this word is in usage now, like uh, with this uh, secret services uh, political center. Uh, in Ukraine, situation is another. There, uh, there is really competing oligarch clans struggling uh, for power and for bigger zones of economical and political influence. Uh, you absolutely correct. Maidan uprising uh, had a lot of anti-oligarchal intention, because this oligarchal rule is really something which makes uh, this country very poor uh, and uh, vulnerable. At the same time, uh, surprisingly, both countries are absolutely neoliberal. Like, even though uh, Putin has uh, some social populism, uh, he year after year, he, for decades now already, he provides neoliberal reforms and also, uh, how to say, strengthening social vulnerability of, of the working people, of the ordinary people. And uh, a Ukrainian state, uh, not Ukrainian state, but Ukrainian society is still much less state controlled. That is important point. It's not like Ukrainian state is no better than other states, but it just has much less tools uh, to confront, to control and to subjugate its own population. Uh, this is still uh, somehow plur pluralistic, uh, like absolutely unlike uh, the Russian situation. And um, I would say still the, there is still much more free atmosphere around here. Like this is not a coincidence that, for example, many comrades from Russia and Belarus, they find uh, shelter exactly here. Uh, because my, much less political repression and uh, state violence is present here. Uh, so here we still see a lot of grounds uh, for making some grassroots initiatives, direct democracy projects, and uh, any, I would say, even social revolutionary uh, developments. While in Russia, we see just this uh, authoritarian hammer, I would say, which smash uh, everything which it meets in its way. So this is one of the big reasons why it needs to be confronted. Uh, Ukrainian state has a lot of disadvantages, um, but Ukrainian society really should be protected uh, from this, this totalitarian uh, threat it faces uh, today and actually faces already decades before. Uh, since Putinist uh, expansionist uh, politics are starting to be in implemented. So this is exactly our reason uh, why to participate in it. We believe in uh, mm, radical social uh, changes uh, within Ukrainian society, uh, but for this, exactly for this, uh, not for protecting some uh, state sovereignty which doesn't make sense for us exactly for possibility for uh, positive social changes uh, putinist inv invasion sh should be severely confronted and i would say that this is the moment of truth uh, when uh, like you know in such war situations uh, very often grassroots ties and uh, self-organization solidarity mutual aid uh, they really take grounds within the population uh, especially when elites betray when uh, you, you know like several days before the invasion uh, many po politicians of Ukraine, they just uh, flew uh, away on their private jets. Uh, so we see uh, pretty clearly that state is not a friend at all for the Ukrainian people. Um, so this is our fight. Our fight is for the people, is for uh, protecting the grounds uh, for the future revolutionary changes, which is now being uh, deadly threatened by the Putinist threat. So one of the conspiracy theories that has been promoted by authoritarians in the so-called anti-imperialist left 
often not promoting leftist values on social justice, but often aligned with the Russian regime and others viewed as being oppositional to the USA, has been that the Maidan movement was a CIA operation to promote the far-right groups such as Privy Sector or Svoboda uh, taking power in a bloodthirsty drive to ethnically cleanse Russians in the Donbass. Can you talk about this this view of what happened or this view of the Ukrainian state or culture in terms of the far-right influence? Yes, well, as the good teacher uh, of this authoritarian propagandist Goebbels uh, said that uh, if you want uh, your lies to be believed in, uh, you should use uh, some corns of truth in it. Uh, so, yes, uh, the far rights, they really had a strong presence uh, in Maidan uprising because they were organizing pretty well uh, before it, like for years before it, and also uh, was somehow affiliated uh, with the authorities and with the secret services as far as we can estimate, um, and also with some criminal business and so on. Uh, because of this, they faced this Maidan uprising in, uh, I would say, pretty good fit, which gave them an opportunity to develop somehow their organizations within Maidan uprising and after it. But still, like in first approach, this is the lie that uh, Ukrainian far rights uh, took more grounds for ethnical uh, cleansing of Russian-speaking population because there is still no actually ethnical cleansing of this population and also really far-right nationalist parties, they are even not presented in parliament. But more important, like, because honestly, I don't give a lot of shit, like who is present in parliament, but more important for me, when I participated in Maidan uprising, I saw by my own eyes hundreds of thousands uh, of, uh, of just ordinary people, of, of grassroots people uh, rebelling against the oligarchical rule, against the humiliation imposed by the uncontrollable criminal president Yanukovych uh, imposed on them. This was really, like, of course, many powers tries to uh, intervene and tries to in try to influence this, mm, not only far right. We was liberals, some fake oppositional parties created by uh, different uh, local olig oligarchs, clans, uh, which we already mentioned today, all of them tried their best to influence their movement. And I would say, like, oligarch Poroshenko, which became next president, uh, pretty succeeded in it. And we can say that Maidan is once again a betrayed revolution, like revolution which was stolen from the people by the oligarchs. Uh, but the Maidan uprising itself uh, were definitely less of nationalist movement and much more uh, of grassroots popular movement against the authorities, against the government, uh, this I would say. Yeah, and that I mean that makes absolute sense. When I when I think to something similar in the United States, like the Occupy movement, uh, in some areas it was it was all sorts of different people coming for their own political reasons to be in that space because they had shared experience of uh, misery under capitalism and and alienation, and in some places the Democratic Party was able to harness some of the energy. It definitely tried. Uh, all over to either harness it or destroy it if it couldn't states and also uh, yeah the relationship between the far right and and security forces is is ubiquitous and international so but on the same topic can you talk about the participation of groups like azov battalion in fighting since the you know at, at least in the war in the donbass that's been happening since 2014 the training of far right foreigners and in, in paramilitary skills and the allowance of their existence in, in or a, alongside of the armed forces in in the Ukrainian military? Oh, yes. Azov Voluntary Battalion was formed uh, soon after Maidan and was really like Nazi initiative uh, to intervene this conflict on Donbass. Uh, soon after, uh, they became a regular regiment of Ukrainian army and somehow integrated within a military hierarchy. Uh, so now they are not like clearly political because still uh, a part of army which is uh, declared to be apart from any politics. Uh, but of course, as a Nazi origin or originated, like Nazi built uh, structure, uh, these people like Nazis, they really still have like core presence in there and leadership within it. Mm, I have no like uh, strict information, uh, but I heard 
many rumors, but from believable sources that, yes, lots of uh, Western Nazis came, and also from, for, for, from Russian Nazis, actually, I- even more uh, from uh, Russian Nazis, they came here to participate in Azov and also to train. Okay. Uh, this is, yes, this really exists. And uh, not only Azov Battalion, they uh, organized their uh, civil branch, uh, which is called uh, National Corps Party, uh, which like um, intervenes actively in Ukrainian political life, but also very much discredited because it's affiliation with criminal activities and also affiliation with the uh, interior ministry of former interior, interior minister Avakov. And all this uh, is called the uh, Azov movement, which is pretty far right movement. Even now, even though now trying to play uh, somehow that we are not Nazis, we are not fascists, we are just conservative nationalists. But uh, like originally, they are really Nazis. They are really in. Uh, still, I have honestly no information about any ethnic cleansing of them uh, being performed like surprisingly many nazis here for example uh, dmitro yarash from pravi sector you mentioned they originates uh, or many of national corps like dmitro yarash is from uh, dnieper city and many of national corps leaders they are from kharkiv like from eastern uh, cities which are predominantly russian so here you can have a lot of russian speaking nazis actually so when somebody tries to portray that this is Ukrainian speaking population against Russian speaking population, this is a pure uh, hoax uh, and tricks. Mm, so yes, um, as I said already before, Nazis are present a lot in local political uh, life. This is true, uh, but they are still much more weak uh, than, for example, just oligarchical forces. Uh, like they are visible, they are hearable, uh, but when somebody tries to manipulate that Ukraine is somehow Nazi state, fascist state, this is of course, uh, this is just a lie. This is just not true. And this is just a tool uh, of manipulation for uh, pro-Putinist forces, which unfortunately took grounds also in Western so-called anti-imperialist movement, because <laughs> really anti-imperialist movement needs to be today with us here confronting this purely imperialist aggression. It seems like the opportunity is present with the recognition that Nazis have been able to organize, far right has been able to organize, and also that that the Putinist forces are are simultaneously like trying to they're they're taking ground quite literally. It seems like an opportunity for anarchists and anti authoritarian anti capitalists to reach out to their neighbors as provide alternatives offer what you mentioned with like mutual aid and also coordinating obviously like people tried to do that during the maidan and and got fl- outflanked basically can you talk about the situation of anarchist and anti-authoritarian movement in ukraine at the moment like um i just saw messages this morning about uh on social media of um many uh, anarchists who had had to flee Belarus, for instance, to Ukraine, des- deciding to stay and to try to uh, like defend the population against invasion. And it, it seems like a lot of people are sort of hunkering down and, and making that decision to to stay. Can you talk about what that anarchist movement looks like? Yes, of course. I would say that Maidan was a really hard blow and the source of depression for anarchist movement because it provided a lot of splits like uh, about attitude and position about Maidan. Uh, some comrades took one ground, uh, other comrades took another one, and this provided a lot of quarrels. Uh, but even more uh, was the negative influence uh, that um, Maidan actually appeared as this betrayed revolution, as I already said before. Some people really believed that it will uh, lead to some positive political changes, but uh, it leads, like, hardly lead, lead it, led to any um, of good changes within the society. So, anarchist movement, and I would say leftist movement in general, found itself uh, in depression in Ukraine for years. But several uh, last years, I think we can speak about restoring movement, because uh, a lot of old participants and also new participants as well, they really are making some analytical work, what needs to be done uh, for the movement to reconstruct itself, to organize better, and which alternatives uh, we can provide for the society. Of course, we need to confront a lot this uh, uh, nationalist sentiment, 
like about our state of Ukraine, this national sentiment, of course, is widespread uh, within the society. This um, pro-Western sentiment I already mentioned, like of people dreaming uh, of a good Western-like life, uh, this is something we really need to work with and uh, fight with. But this is possible. And of course, this, how to say, this gray zone of Europe, this uh, weak state, still weak state, because Russia looks pretty stable, even though I believe that it's not like this uh, actually. Like, I don't know good English words for it, but a Russian Putinist regime is something super big, which will collapse very fastly finally. But this is like my belief. Uh, European Union, of course, looks as well pretty stable. And Ukrainian is, Ukraine is not like this. So, of course, this is naturally the ground uh, for the grassroots organizing and for some... Mm, really very different political alternatives to be developed and presented, including our ones. So I guess in in your view, and I know you've kind of addressed this already, but um, how have anarchists and how have anarchists abroad been reacting to these developments? Not knowing what's coming for sure, but I mean, since the shellings already started, it seems kind of clear, but the situation might change. What forms of solidarity would you like to see coming from abroad? For instance, Crime Think um, just put out a a tweet about um, calling for tonight at 7 p.m. or 6 p.m. everywhere for there to be demonstrations at Russian embassies. Is this um, one of the things that you'd like to see? Is there more than that that you would like to see? Oh, yes. Uh First of all, uh, I want to greet uh, my comrades in Moscow, which held uh, yesterday uh, the actions against the invasions. It was anarchists uh, who organized them, and several were arrested. Uh, it means that actually anarchist comrades and uh, some anti-war actions there actually exist uh, in Russia already. Uh, so the situation here now is actually, first of all, is challenge for us. Will we be able to develop the narrative, the concept uh, of libertarian participation, like uh, meaningful participation in this anti-imperialist uh, resistance. Like it needs to be anti-imperialist uh, resistance with some really social revolutionary goals and prospects. Also, the next challenge to us, if we will be able to form our structures, uh, both in, forms, uh, in terms of self-defense uh, and of civil organizing. And uh, as long as we will be able to do it, uh, we need growing support informationally uh, and also by the actions of solidarity and also maybe by some material support, of course, uh, from our Western comrades. Uh, so any expression of solidarity already now is extremely appreciated and extremely needed uh, throughout all the world. If you want to make graffiti, do it. If you want to make demonstration against a rational Belarusian embassy, uh, do it. This is also a good point to support uh, anarchist political prisoners, which are a lot both in Russia and Belarus. If you want to collect some money, do it. If you want to spread our information, which I hope will be extensively translated, uh, like published first and translated into English as well, uh, this is also a very good way uh, to express your solidarity. Uh, so I believe solidarity actions, uh, media informational help, uh, and also uh, providing material support and infrastructural support uh, for us, for anarchist movement here, for libertarian movement here, would be really good grounds for us to to rely on. I guess one more question is, so, and this is sort of, I've seen this discussed a little bit, not, not the perspectives of people in Ukraine, um, but other anarchists elsewhere talking about the difficulty of being engaged in or around official state organizations of defense uh, while keeping autonomy and keeping an anti-state so pro-social perspective. Can you talk a little bit about that balance and, and what sort of discussions anarchists and anti-authoritarian leftists in Ukraine are having about that? Yes, I think I can do it. Uh, like, of course, especially this is the hard question in terms of self-defense, because uh, uh, every authorized self-defense uh, is coming from the state, more or less. Uh, so there is a challenge, like, uh, if we want uh, to have self-defense and not uh, confronting on every front, and we are few, so we need to collaborate uh, somehow with the uh, state military structures. 
uh, and the question is how not to assimilate to these structures and but still collaborate somehow having some sort of autonomy and our own vision and perspective well i don't want to lie to say that we have perfect plan how to do it but definitely we realize uh, this problem and uh, we work and find some i would say tricky ways to do it like to uh, really have um, uh, self defense as much uh, uh, independent uh, from the state structures as possible uh, and uh, i think this is what really political movements should do like uh, like we see it a lot in kurdistan for example uh, this maneuvering uh, to protect uh, their own perspective uh, and sovereignty and this is at least in much less scales than in kurdistan but uh, in principle is the same uh, what we are trying to do here Another important problem is, uh, I would say, ideological assimilation to the state discourse, because uh, many people even uh, who asso associate themselves with the anarchist movement starting to say, uh, like, OK, we are no now just need to defend our country. Well, uh, in this situation, to defend your country is pretty good, but this is not enough at all uh, for the anarchist revolutionary. Like, um, uh, you need uh, to develop some uh, perspective for changes, like uh, some ideas on how you want to influence political and social situation within the country. And this is also the matter of discussions, of uh, somehow even very hot discussions, and our continuous thinking here. Uh, but more or less, we are, like most of us, agreeing that we need within this struggle, anti imperialist struggle, and our participation in it, uh, we need to express, uh, to develop and express our anarchist narrative and program and uh, ideas. Thank you so much, Ilya, for having this conversation with me. And um, we'll be sure to to provide the, the links that um, comrades in Ukraine have, have shared to keep up. And um, I hope that this conversation helps get more people in the streets. And good luck. Thanks a lot to you. Good luck. We are staying in contact. Please. Yeah. And solidarity and um, share my love with the people there. Uh, I'll let you go now, but um, take care. Yeah, thanks a lot. We are now here with the comrades, uh, like finding our ways to do. And uh, we say like greetings to you. Thanks for your support. Solidarity. solidarity. Ciao. Ciao. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Are you tired of listening to Western experts talking how the world works? Is another portion of liberal analysis of the uprising makes you fall asleep? Well, then check Elephant in the Room, an anarchist radio show from European Dresden, where we interview activists who are participating in struggles around the world. Elephant in the Room is a proud member of Channel Zero Network. You can find our show on your favorite podcast platforms, CZN website, or somewhere on the internet. From activists for activists. This is the final straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at the Final Straw Radio. P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.
Место махно. 